Hello, everybody. How are you? This is Pastor Paul. Excuse me, had a little bit of a snafu. God bless me. God bless me. Y'all pray for a brother. Uh, pray for a brother. But we're here. We're live. We're ready to roll. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, we didn't have our audio on. That was my fault. So that's on me. So y'all do me a favor and pray for me. Keep me lifted. Trying to do so many things at one time to prepare for this amazing time that we spend together. It's called Sunday Sermon 2.0. This is our opportunity to re review, reflect, and respond. We're going to review our sermon from Sunday, dig a little bit deeper, go in a little bit more than we did on Sunday. Then we're going to reflect, take an opportunity to think about it and consider it as it applies to our life. And then if there are any changes or adjustments that we need to make as believers, we're going to respond to the word of God by making those changes. Welcome to Sunday Sermon 2.0. Today, our topic is God is able 2.0. God is able 2.0. I'm really excited about what we're going to share on today. I'm really looking forward to spending this time with you all. So let's go ahead and get started with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you blessed us to see. We thank you for being so good to us and so kind, God, so generous. You are utterly amazing, God, and you're awesome. And we're grateful. We're grateful for you waking us up this morning and giving us another opportunity at life taking care of us throughout the day, protecting us and bringing us to this time where we can share and study in the word of God together. We ask you to share your heart with us tonight, minister to us, speak to us, Lord God, and say the things that we need to hear tonight. We love you so much, God. We give you all of the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. If you came in a little late, it's going to be funny, but I listen, we all forget things. And so uh, I'm laughing at myself because I think that's too funny. Uh, but y'all pray for a brother. Uh, you know, as I get older, I'm working on making sure that my mind is still sharp. And uh, but sometimes that memory can get away from you. Uh, let's go to Daniel three. Uh, we're going to start at verse 17, 16, excuse me, Daniel three, verse 16. And remember, this is Sunday Sermon 2.0. This is the opportunity to review, reflect and respond. We're reviewing our text from Sunday. We're going to reflect on what's there, and then we're going to respond by making the adjustments in our lives. Daniel 3, 16 through 18, here's what it says. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I want you to really focus in on this last line, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. That's the first thing they said, the first statement. We will not serve thy gods, nor will we worship the golden image which thou has set up. So the focus for our lesson this evening is going to be three things. We have three points of focus. The first point of focus is the importance of our commitment to God. That's the first point of focus, the importance of us being committed to God. The second point of focus is the importance of our belief that God is committed to us. Very important that we believe that God is committed to us. Th this helps us in the area of faith. This helps us actually to be committed. Number two helps us with number one. OK, and then number three, we want to expose the strategy of the enemy. And this is really where the 2.0 comes in. We want to expose the strategy of the enemy. Now, the word committed, it means devoted faithful, loyal, wholeheartedly dedicated, and unwavering. I'll read those again because I really want us to hear those. Uh, it is to be committed is to be devoted, 
to be faithful, to be loyal, to be wholeheartedly dedicated and to be unwavering in our allegiance. So this is what it means for us to be committed to God. It means we're faithful. It means that God can depend on us and God can count on us. It means that through the highs and the lows and ups and downs of life, that we're not going to flake out on God, that we're not going to give up on God and walk away from our relationship, that we're going to stay connected to him and we're going to continue to live for him and represent him in the earth. But God's commitment to us is that no matter what, he's always there. And, and here's what I love about God. The scripture says that even when we're faithless, God is faithful. And it says he can't deny himself. There are certain things about who God is that God simply cannot shut off. He, can, he cannot simply turn these things about himself on and off. God is faithful. God is loving. God is kind. God is forgiving. God is generous. All of those things about God, he has to be faithful to himself, to who he is. And so we can count on God to be committed to us. And then there's the strategy of the enemy. I want us to really pay attention to this lesson tonight because I think we're going to see some things exposed that we're going to be able to look at right now in 2021. And we're going to be able to see how the enemy has been using the same tricks all along. So these three young men made their stand and they trusted God. It wasn't that they didn't have respect for the king. It was simply that they respected God more. What happened to these three young men, the Hebrew boys, we, we preach and teach so much about them being in the fiery furnace. And I felt that what they did before going into the fiery furnace was noteworthy and that it was worthy of our time. What happened was that they were put into a position where they had to choose their allegiance and they chose God. They did not refuse to bow in protest to the king's directive. They simply refused to compromise in their belief that worship was reserved for God alone. So this was no formal protest. This was not them uh, sticking their chest out in, in, in the face of the king. This was not them being rebellious. This was simply them asserting that for us, worship is reserved for God alone. Can you imagine the pressure that these men were under? I want you to think about this for just a moment. Think about the pressure that they're under. Now, I just read a scripture to you that says they told the king standing in front of the fiery furnace, it doesn't matter what, what you say, we're not going to serve your God and we're not going to bow down to this statue you built. The God we serve is able to deliver us from the finer, from the burning fiery furnace. And he's able to he's going to deliver us out of your hand. Right. So here they are standing in front of a fiery furnace. Death is imminent. And these young men, young men are standing up for God. Can you imagine the amount of pressure that they wonder? The king's questioning the roaring fire their accusers standing all around them. But there was a lot at stake, things that I think we miss because we go through the text too quickly because it was the leaders that were called to the dedication. Uh, 2.0. This is a 2.0 moment. The leaders are the ones who were instructed to come to the dedication. Let's look at Daniel 3, 2 through 6 for a moment. We want to back up and get a little bit of context. It says, then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then and, and excuse me, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then and Herod cried aloud 
To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. I want you to think about the level of pressure that these young men are under. They understand that if they do not bow down to this statue that Nebuchadnezzar has erected, that they are going to be penalized and punished by being thrown into the fiery furnace. And from my study, I understand that Nebuchadnezzar was no joke. There was one saying about him that he didn't rest day nor night because justice in his eyes was that important to him. And so this burning people in the fiery furnace was no new thing. This is chronicled in the book of Jeremiah. This was a real thing. And they knew that their lives were at stake, but something much larger was at stake. Many times we see life in a vacuum and we only see ourselves. But the thing is that how we live for God and how we represent God has far reaching implications. That there are others that are watching us and there are others who are learning from us, especially those of us who are leaders. And this is why I wanted to talk about that particular thing. The fact that the leaders are the one who were called to the dedication. I want everybody to know that this is strategic. This is strategic because people follow leaders. People follow leaders. And if the leaders condone the action, it seems less dangerous to the people. When leaders come out and they condone a certain action, if they exhibit a certain type of behavior, those who follow that leader, they think that because the leader has done it, that it is okay to be done. So he calls the lead. This is strategy. He calls the leaders first to the dedication and he tells them, okay, you all are supposed to bow when you hear that music. Now, all of the nations and the other people were there. But how many of you know that they were watching the leaders to see what the leader's reaction to this moment was going to be? Again, this is strategic. This is how the culture works. Somebody say 2.0. This is one of those 2.0 moments. That is how the culture works. People of influence are used to influence our decisions and beliefs. That's why they use people who are stars to sell us products. That's why stars set the tone for what people do. They use people of influence to influence others who follow them, who look up to them. And that's why leadership is so important. Everybody should not desire to be a leader because being a leader, it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week job. People are watching you to see how you flow, how you do it, what your attitude is like. So if you've got a leader who's speaking negatively about another leader and someone who's following that leader overhears them, they think that it's OK now for them to do the same thing. A bad precedence is being set. So what the culture does is when the culture wants to influence our thinking, when the culture wants to influence our behavior, the culture will bring on people of influence, po politicians, stars, people who are wealthy, right? Musicians, bring those people on to push whatever the agenda is that they want to push. That's the way it works. They, this is the way it works. It worked that way then and it works that way now, all right? But what we have to do is be independent thinkers and rely on God and the spirit for his influence. We gotta be the kind of people that will ask ourselves, 
What does God's word say? There's a lot going on right now. There's a lot of people saying a lot of stuff. But what does God's word say? There are people right now who are so heavily influenced by what they've heard people of certain status say that they're making their decisions based on somebody who doesn't even know them or their situation. They're not seeking God. The scripture says to us that we're supposed to acknowledge God in all our ways and he will direct our path, not people. I don't see a scripture where it says acknowledge people in all your ways. Now, the scripture says that there's safety in the multitude of counsel. That is true. But you better be careful who you're getting counsel from. Need to be careful that you're going to people that you know have lent their ear to God so that God can minister through them to you. And if what that person is saying to you does not line up with what's in scripture, then you know you don't need to be influenced by that. No matter who that person is, we have to ask ourselves, what does God's word say? So what does God's word say about worshiping idols, about bowing down to idols and worshiping other gods? Well, Exodus 20, two through five. Let's see what God's word says on the matter. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. That's something for God to equate worshiping an idol God with hating him. God said, you either love me with everything or you don't love me at all. God's not willing to be second, y'all. God is making it very clear that he is not willing to be second that he is not willing to be among the gods we worship. But God wants to be the only God we worship. What else did God say? Exodus 34, 14. For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. My goodness. God said his name is jealous. He's jealous for us. Somebody type down in the timeline, God is jealous for me. God is jealous for you. God doesn't want to share you with anything or anyone else. God wants to have all of your heart. That's why when God said that we're going to have a relationship, this is what it's going to have to look like. He said, you're going to have to love me with all your heart, all your mind and all your soul. In another place, Jesus said, and with all your strength. And even in the scriptures, it says, listen, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you can follow me. But first, you got to deny yourself. Oh, my goodness. God, God says, I got to be first even before you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody declare God is jealous for me. God doesn't want to share you with another God. God doesn't want to share you with your job. God doesn't want to share you with money. God doesn't want to share you with the things that you own. Come on. God wants to be first. God doesn't matter, mind us having a good job. God doesn't mind us having nice clothes and a nice vehicle and a nice house. But he never wants those things to compete with him for our affection or attention. God wants to be First, what else does God say about this idol worship thing? Deuteronomy 6 and 14. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. Don't you dare go out there worshiping the gods that the people around you worship. The things that we see people worshiping right now, we need to avoid. God's word said, don't you fall after them, folks. What did John say? John said, love not the world, neither the things in the world. 
And I like the way the message says it. It says, because the love of the world squeezes out love for the father. It's a gradual thing where the more we love this stuff in this place, it slowly squeezes out the love that we have for God. And that love is replaced with something else that's not God. So God said, don't you mess around and follow up behind these folks worshiping the gods that they worship. What else does God say? Deuteronomy 11 and 16. Boy, I'm having some fun with this. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and ye turn and serve other gods and worship them. Watch yourself. Somebody say, watch yourself. Oh man, you gotta be careful. Take heed to yourself. You know, people watching other folk, you better watch yourself. People are always watching you, trying to see what you're doing. And while they're watching you, who's watching them? Are they keeping tack, uh, tabs on themselves? That's our responsibility for us to watch our own walk. Yeah, go ahead and type down in the timeline. I need to watch my walk. I need to make sure that I'm walking circumspectly that I'm living in a way that pleases God. I need to I need to keep tabs on my own self, right? Isaiah 44 and 6. Y'all, there's a lot of scriptures about this idol worship thing. Listen to what God is saying. Isaiah 44 and 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. You hear God talking? God said, I am the first and I am the last. There's no room for anybody else. He said, and beside me, there is no God. Let's look at Isaiah 44 and 8. Are y'all having fun yet? I am. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no God. I know not any. <laughs> God is saying, hey, y'all, y'all are my witnesses. Is there another God besides me? God said, nope, there is no God. I know not any. God said, I don't know of any other gods. Don't you dare worship those statues and those things that you made with your own hand. Why would somebody worship something that they made? That means you have power over it. God says you can call on those gods all you want to. They don't have ears so they can't hear. They don't have eyes so they can't see. And they don't have a mouth so they can't speak. They can't help you. This is what these guys had in their mind, y'all. What they had been taught. One more scripture, Isaiah 45, 22. I promise I'm going to stop after this one. This is the last one. Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Yeah, for I am God and there is none else. Wow. He said, hey, look to me and be saved. You want deliverance? God said, you got to look to me. You can't look somewhere else. You can't look to these other built and made up gods, these man-made gods. God said, if you want to be saved, if you want to be delivered, if you delivered, if you want to be healed, he said, you got to look to me. Hallelujah. We can't look to our money. Glory to God. And we've learned we can't look to the politicians. Talk to me, somebody. We can't look. There are people that we've been looking. There are people that we've been looking to to help us. They can't help us. They're doing the best they can, but they're not God. They're not God. Even when we go to the doctor, you know what? Yeah, the doctor has gone to school and learned a lot. But I'm going to tell you, I will trust in the Lord. <laughs> I'm putting my faith in God. I'm asking God to use the doctor. Amen. Amen. Come on, talk to me, y'all. God is our deliverer. God is our savior. And he said, if you want to be saved, you got to look to me. Now, 
I want you to look at the size of this statue. All right. It gives these things with cubits. But I want to tell you that in my research, I discovered that this statue, along with the base that held it, was about 90 feet high and nine feet wide. So it wasn't the statue itself that was the full 90 feet, but it was also the pedestal or the base that it was on. It was in, in total 90 feet high and nine feet wide. Somebody say that's big. That's a tall, big statue. Can you imagine seeing something that big? It's huge, but it's made to be easily visible. Pay very close attention. It's made to be easily visible. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want anybody to miss this image. He wanted everybody to see this image. So he made it as large as they had the technology to make it at the time. To keep it in front of them constantly. Stay with me now. He wanted it to be before their eyes all the time. Movies, TV shows, music, commercials, magazine, keeping the images. Oh, before our eyes constantly, keeping it where we can see it all the time, hear about it all the time, read about it all the time. You see, the, 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 the point is, is that if we keep it in front of them, they will eventually become accepted as the norm. If we keep pushing it out to them and keep it in front of them, they'll see it so much that they'll accept it as normal. <laughs> A big 90 foot statue was not statue was not normal. But after people would walk by it day after day after day after day after day, it would become a commonplace thing to see it. It wouldn't be a big deal. And that's the way it works, y'all. Keeping it in front of our eyes day after day. Turn on the TV, it's there. Watch a movie, it's there. Turn on the radio, it's there. Read a magazine, it's there. Open a book, it's there. Oh! to influence what we believe and what we see as normal. The enemy is always working. The strategy is to have the statue to be worshiped or to influence the culture to adopt their belief systems. This is what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, he put up the statue so it could be worshiped. And listen, whether or not they were polytheistic or not. He didn't care. His agenda was whether you worship one God or not. Today, when you hear this music, you're going to worship this God. And think about if you do that over and over and over and over again, right? What happens? You will begin to accept and adopt people's belief system. Remember the accusation. They do not worship your God, nor do they bow down to the statue. This is the accusation they made against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The first thing they said was, these guys don't worship your gods. You've been putting this out here, and they, they hadn't done it. They have refused to adapt your customs. They are living decidedly different from everybody else in the culture, King. Everybody else is bowing except these three guys. They're a problem. They're a problem, right? They're not, they won't even bow to the statue. Look at the case they're building because these guys, they saw idol worship every day, but they refused to adjust and adapt to the customs of the culture. They lived a decidedly different life. They loved God. They were committed. They were committed to God. They were committed, so they were faithful. 
They were wholeheartedly devoted to God. And there was no space in their heart for another God. There was no space in their life for a giant golden statue. Can you hear me? Their hearts was filled up with love for God. And that's the way we have to be. The culture is presenting so many different things to us day after day, night after night, through so many different media outlets trying to bombard us with this stuff until we accept it as ordinary and every day. But we know that this is not the way God wants things to be. So something in our spirit just won't let us accept these things as being normal. There are murders every night. There are people being killed every night. And some people get so beat down by the fact that somebody dying every night until they say, well, this is ordinary. This, is, this happens every night. But something's wrong with somebody getting killed every night. I don't care how many times you put it on the news and you present it, how many times you put it in movies, how many times you write it in book. People killing people is not a normal thing. My spirit just can't accept that as being normal. That's just one example. But there's so many things, y'all. It's just like that statue. Keep it in front of their eyes. Look at the severity of the punishment. Can I tell you that threats are the device of the day? Threats are still the device of the day. Still being threatened to this day. The only way he saw that he could get people to do what he wanted was fear. Fear to manipulate them to worship in a God that they didn't even believe in. Just for the sake of saving their lives. Just for the sake of saving their careers. Uh oh. Yeah. There are people who are bowing the statues that they don't even believe in, trying to save something. But the Bible declares that if you try to save your life, you lose it. But if you lose it and you let it go, it says you'll save it. Hallelujah. Let me move on. Let me move on. Colossians 2 and 8. This is a great scripture for us. Listen to this. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after tra the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. All right. Be careful. Be careful. Don't let anybody spoil you through vain, through, through philosophy and, and, and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world. We're not buying into this world system. No, 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 no. Sin is sin every day of the week. If God calls it sin, guess what it is? Sin. We can clean it up and give it another name, but you want to know what it is? Sin. If you take sin and you wrap it up, you put it in a box and you wrap it up in a pretty gold package and you put a red bow on it, you want to know what's in that pretty box? Sin. We call stuff all kinds of stuff. Rename it. But guess what God calls it? Sin. Worshiping an idol God for whatever reason somebody might do it. Save the job, save the career, get money. To, to promote their career, to move ahead. Guess what it is? Sin. Even if everybody else is doing it, it's sin. And these guys weren't having it. They weren't having it. They say, no, nah, man, uh, -uh. serving God got us here. Serving God's going to keep us here. We are not going to betray our God by worshiping some big old statue you got covered in gold. That is not God. That is not God. In that first scripture, God reminded him. He said, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that delivered you from the Egyptians. Now, I'm the one that saved you. Don't you dare go out there worshiping behind those gods that never done a thing for you. So the question tonight is, who is the one who saved you? Who is the one who delivered you? Who is the one who healed you? See the pressure. Somebody shout the pressure. The pressure. There are people who put them, there are some people who put forth themselves as the end all, the be all, or the be all, it ends all. One of the one of them. 
they have such a high opinion of themselves that they think they can ruin your whole life with the decision that they can make. They don't have that kind of power. And we need to know that. Here's the thing. We need to know God is committed to us. We talked about it Sunday. Nebuchadnezzar is nobody's source. A boss on a job is nobody's source. Huh? But people think that they think because they have the power to hire and fire that somehow they have the power to control you and to change your whole world. Newsflash, they don't have that kind of power. God is the one who gave you the job. I've seen situations where people have had nasty, arrogant bosses and the bosses were gone before the people were. The person was still the person that was being uh, attacked by that boss. that was being mistreated by that boss was still there and the boss was gone. I heard one story where a man was treated badly by his boss. He began to pray and ask God to move on the boss's heart and God moved the boss. <laughs> and when God moved the boss, they gave him the job that the boss used to have. Somebody talk to me. God's able to do things like that. But see, the attitude of these, these gentlemen, they were so respectful. That's what I got to give them. See, in today's Christian society, we have like kind of an arrogant Christianity where we just going to put, you know, no, they, they, they didn't they didn't mess with nobody. They didn't bother anybody. Those folk that were out there bowing, they weren't out there saying you ought to be ashamed. They are. Uh -uh. They just refused to bow. All right. In the words of Joshua, whether you're going to worship the gods of uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, these people around here worship. Or you're going to worship the living God. That's up to you. Y'all choose. But Brother Joshua said, as for me in my house. We're going to serve the Lord. So even Joshua said, man, y'all, y'all pick, man, it's up to y'all. Y'all want to worship these idols who never did anything for y'all? That's up to y'all. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And, and that's still the way it is. People are going to make the decision that they make. But the question is, what decision are we going to make? We're not going to allow the pressures, right, to make us make a decision against God. All right. So let me go ahead because it's time to close this out. Now, again. The guys did not protest or try to stop others from exercising their rights to bow. They merely exercised their rights to be faithful to God. There's a, a pastor named Adrian Rogers. I used to listen to he's he going on to heaven now. I used to listen to him all the time. And I remember he said, this is the United States of America. You have the right to be wrong. Y'all, I had to stop my car. That thing messed me up. He, he literally said that people have the right to be wrong. And, and they, didn't, they didn't try to influence those people's rights or impede upon their right to bow down and worship that statue. All they did was exercise their right to be faithful to God. And can I tell you, that's all you got to do in order to make people mad at you. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to bother them. All you got to do is just be faithful to God and people won't like it. They'll have a problem with it. There's a scripture that says that we do not run to the excess that they run to. And basically what that scripture means is that People are upset because we're not doing what they do. We don't believe what they believe. We have not embraced what they embrace. And they have a problem with the fact that we live differently. You don't have to do anything. Just be a Christian. Just love God. Just be faithful. Just refuse to lower your standards. And there'll be some people who won't like you because of that. But that's not your problem, is it? Because being faithful to God, that's our faith, our first priority, y'all. That is our first priority. So listen, they trusted that 
that their commitment to God would be met by God's commitment to them. That's why they made that statement. King, listen, you know, whatever, bro, do what you do what you need to do. Uh, really, we, we there's no reason for us to rehash this. We understand what the consequences are. We don't bow. We're not going to do it. We're not going to bow. We're not going to worship your gods. So if, if, if you feel the need to put us into the furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from that furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, okay? They believe that their commitment to God would be met by God's commitment to them. And that's what we have to believe. God, I'm going to be faithful to you in this matter. And I believe that you're going to be faithful to me. God, I'm going to stick to your word in this matter. I'm going to do what your word says, and I'm going to trust you to be faithful to your word. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to do what other people do to get ahead. God, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm going to do my work as unto the Lord. I'm going to trust you to take care of me. Yeah, God, they're treating me bad. They're mistreating me. They're talking about me bad, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pray for those who despitefully use me and, 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 and do all manner of evil against me, God. I'm going to pray for my enemies. I'm not going to render evil for evil, God. Hallelujah. I'm going to do it your way, and I'm going to trust you, God, that when I'm committed to you, you be committed to me. I trust that. And God, here's, here's what I know, God. Even when I struggle with commitment, when I have commitment issues, you're still committed to me. Ah, you're still faithful. Oh, my God. Has anybody ever had commitment issues? Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. Has anybody in here ever messed up and did the wrong thing and did what you weren't supposed to do, right? Slipped up. Said some words you shouldn't have said, had an attitude you shouldn't have had, acted the way you shouldn't have acted, done something you shouldn't have done, right? Guess what? God was still faithful, still woke us up, still put food in our bellies and clothes on our back, roof over our head. I thank God for his commitment, y'all. I thank God for his commitment. And here's the part that I love. 2.0, 2.0. Ready? Even if God didn't do what they expected, they would still remain faithful. <laughs> A lot of people's faithfulness to God is really based on if God does what they want. There are some people who fallen away from God because God didn't do what they expected. He didn't do what they wanted. But these guys said, yeah, we want to live. We want to be delivered. We don't want to die, but if it doesn't go the way we want it, even if it doesn't work out the way we want it to work out, we're still not going to bow. We're still going to be committed to God. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, the scripture says that he was exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Told the disciples, he said, y'all stay here and watch while I pray. He goes off by himself and he prays and he says, Father, if there's any way that you can take this cup away from me, please, Lord, let that be done. He said, but not my will. Thine be done. He went and checked on the disciples. They were asleep. He woke them up and he chided them about the fact that they had sleep. They're going to sleep. And he went back and he prayed that same prayer again. And he ended and he said, but Lord, not my will. Thy will be done. That's the life we are supposed to live. You know, sometimes we pray and God does it just the way we want it. And then people of God, saints of God, there are times when God has another plan altogether. And our faithfulness to God cannot waver during those seasons when we don't get what we desire. Our faithfulness to God 
has got to be God, whatever your plan is, whatever your will is, I love you and I serve you. Because guess what? Even when we don't do what God wants, he's still faithful to us. I hope that touches somebody today. So I think that Psalm 56 and 11 sums up what the Hebrew boys were trying to say to the king very well. Psalm 56 and 11, here it is. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do to me. In 2021, somebody will say mic drop. This is basically what they were saying. We're putting our trust in God. We're not afraid of what man can do. Because what man can do is really limited by what God allows him to do. Just like the devil couldn't even touch Job without permission. That, per that person that might be threatening you, they can't do a thing unless God allows them to. And I learned from Joseph that even when they mean it for evil, God means it for my good. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. <laughs> Thank you, God, for taking us deeper into the study about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you for encouraging us to remain committed to you and reminding us that you are always committed to us. And thank you, Lord, for exposing the strategies of the enemy because they really haven't changed. They're the same. But help us, Lord, to be able to remain committed to your standard and to your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for hanging out with me tonight. I really enjoyed this. I, I, I'm really enjoying this new format where we get to go back and we get to review, reflect, and respond. This review was good for me. I hope it was good for you. And reflecting on that, thinking about it, giving time for it to marinate, oh man, that's so good. Now it's time for us. If there are any adjustments we need to make in our life, Based on what we've studied tonight, let's make those adjustments. All right. God bless y'all. Listen, if you're not saved and you would like to give your life to Christ tonight, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. Please forgive me according to your promised word. Lord, I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe that you gave your son Christ to die on the cross in my place to redeem me from all my sin. I also believe that you raised him up on the third day, just as the scripture says, and that he is alive right now, making intercession for the saints. I believe, God, that when I confess and believe that I am saved according to your word. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me tonight, I want you to text the word salvation to 912-325-9959. Please text the word salvation to 912-325-9959. Now, as you know, we are in hurricane season. There's a storm out there. Uh, there's a storm out on the ocean. Uh, I don't know which way it's moving, but because we're in that season, you need to make sure that you're on our contact list so that we can send out a text to you to let you let you know if anything's changed. So you need to text the word contact to 912-325-9959. Again, if you're not on that contact list, text the word contact to 912-325-9959. I want you to pray for our schools. Pray for our schools. Remember, we don't talk about the mountain. We speak to the mountain. That's what we do because we're people of faith. So I'm asking you to pray for our school system here locally and pray for all schools all over the nation. Pray for the children, the students, and pray for everyone who's a part of the school staff. 
Pray for those in leadership. There's a lot of pressure, a lot going on right now. But we're the people of God and we can pray and we can ask God to move. All right. If my people, which are called by my name, that's us. Right. All right. Let's humble ourselves and pray. Turn from our wicked ways and seek his face. Amen. He says that I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and I will heal the land. Now, remember the proverb a week challenge, y'all, the proverb a week challenge. This is week two. We're on Proverbs chapter two. You're supposed to be reading that from different uh, translations, going back and doing a deep dig study with your Bible dictionary and commentaries. And then at the end of the week, you're supposed to be writing down and journaling what you've learned. Proverbs is rich. It's rich with wonderful instruction for the believer. So please take the time out to do that. Well, everybody, that's everything for today. Once again, I want to say thank you for being with us for this Sunday Sermon 2.0 Bible study. On behalf of myself, Pastor Leslie, and our leadership team, I want to say God bless you. Make sure you stay safe. And I speak the blessing of God over the people of God, the blessing that makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Now stay tuned for our virtual announcements. Mm -hmm.